Council Member Du Bois. Here. Vice Mayor Niss. Council Member Ku. Chair Wolbach. Here. Three present. Okay, so uh, for oral communications, do we have any speakers? It looks like not. So should we move on to our one and only action item of the day, which is a discussion of the fraud, waste, and abuse hotline. Harriet, do you want to start us off? Sure. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, Harriet Richardson, City Auditor. So um, I'm here to discuss um, the fraud, waste, and abuse hotline protocols. And um, you have in front of you a copy of the um, current protocols and a copy of the proposed changes in track changes, and then in that place's memo to change one title of this title of Section 9 from uh, discipline to corrective action. We changed the language in the paragraph, but then didn't change the title. So that's um, everything you have in front of you, plus the PowerPoint that I'll be going through. So um, I went through the the protocols. I, I made some edits. I coordinated with um, the city attorney's office and the city manager's office on these changes. So I think we're in good shape for the direction we're headed with them. Um, for a little bit of background, um, the council adopted the current hotline administration policy um, along with the permanent um, hotline project um, in May 2013 after a 10-month pilot period. So we have a third-party vendor that we contract with that administers our hotline, uh, Navix Global. It's available to employees only. Um, external parties can't use it. And it's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 day days a year. Um, the original pilot program was based on an audit that was done um, by, by one of my predecessors back in 2008 on um, City of Palo Alto employee ethics policies. Um, that resulted in both the hotline pilot project, subsequently the permanent um, placement of the hotline, and also the city manager's office developing uh, an employee ethics policy, which all employees got training on last year. So when callers, um, Want to, when someone wants to make a call to the hotline, they have the option of calling in anonymously or they can provide their name. Most people do prefer to call in anonymously, but we have had some people um, provide their name. When a call comes in, it goes to the third party administrator. Then um, they take the information about the call from the employee, um, what their complaint is. They try to get as much information about the issue as they can. And then, um, then it goes into a case management system. And then we get an email letting us know that there's a new case. And so then we can go log into the system and look at the case. And then we have a hotline review committee, which consists of me, um, the city manager and the city attorney, the three of us get together when a new case comes in. We look at the case and decide, is that, first of all, does it meet the require? Uh, does the description fall under the definition of fraud, waste, and abuse? If it does, is there enough information to investigate it? And then we would make a decision to investigate. If it doesn't fall within the, um, oh, here it's Liz, I'll wait a second before I continue. If it doesn't fall within the definition of fraud, waste, and abuse, we would decide either that to send a response doesn't fit within the protocols of the hotline, or we might refer it out to a department for um, review and action, which we've done in some cases. Um, we don't ask for a response back in those cases, but if it's investigated, then we would go through the process of investigating and reporting um, what the outcome was, either substantiated or not substantiated. So since the um, hotline's inception in um, 2012, there have been 34 calls received. Six of those were received during the, um, during the pilot period. So um, what are the primary reasons we wanted to propose some changes? The main reason is that there's been a lack of clarity among employees about what the purpose of the hotline is. So the majority of the calls that we receive don't actually relate to fraud, waste, or abuse. A lot of them are um, just general disagreement with the management decision 
or something that we might classify as a personnel issue or they just don't fit within the definition of fraud, waste and abuse. Several of those calls, of those um, 34 calls that we received were actually um, multiple versions of um, single issues. So we received 11 calls regarding one issue and two calls regarding another issue. That narrowed it down to 23 uh, actual issues. 14 of those were investigated, but only two of those were um, substantiated. The other reason we wanted to um, revisit the protocols is we um, had previously, when we had something we want to investigate, we would send it out to the departments and say, please look into this and, and um, send us back the outcome. We would give them access to the case management system just for that case. But what they were doing was they would put information in, not substantiated, closed. And we didn't get enough information to really know what they had done to investigate the case and whether it really should have been closed. My office is responsible for reporting on the outcomes of the cases and I wasn't feeling comfortable that I could report and support that it really should have been uh, been closed. So um, moving forward, um, that's one of the things that I'm addressing in, um, in some of the changes. But before we um, decide, before I decided what to look at actually changing, I did a, a survey of other jurisdictions around the country and actually Canada too, um, about how they use hot, their hotlines. Um, it is common for the hotlines to be placed in the auditor's office. And so I actually received quite a bit, a few responses, 39 jurisdictions responded. And from those, I was able to identify a lot of common themes about what they do to inform employees about their hotline. Um, actually, 35 of those 39 employees allow calls from outside their um, employee base also. So residents can call in, um, contractors can call in. So they, they a lot, most of the jurisdictions have expanded it beyond just employees. Um, so some of the things that I identified, most of them do some sort of education of their employees to inform them what the hotline is and how to use it. The most common things are, are that they provide information at their new employee orientations. Um, several of them create posters that they hang around facilities that have information about what fits within the hotline. And they update those posters at least annually to just kind of refresh um, employees' view of what they're seeing and just a little reminder. Some of them create and distribute brochures or little wallet cards. Um, this is an example of a little wallet card that you might see some jurisdictions um, prepare. Um, and then some of them put information on employee pay stubs, just a little notice on there about what the hotline is and call if they see fraud, waste, or abuse. Um, they might do that generally two times a year. And some jurisdictions actually have a mandatory annual training or presentation that they do. Some do online training where they have a training um, video that people can log into their system and then they can actually see that and um, that they're required to look at that um, periodically so that they can be refreshed about what the fraud, waste, and abuse hotline is. Other jurisdictions provide information in all employee emails. And several jurisdictions have dedicated internet or intranet pages. And um, some of the common things I saw when actually looking at those are um, sections with frequently asked questions so that employees can go in and see what's the definition of fraud, waste, and abuse? What types of things do we investigate? What types of things don't we investigate? How do we handle a complaint once we receive it? So a lot of common information that people would have questions about to help them understand understand what the purpose of the hotline is and what happens to their complaint once it's received. Thing that affects the city directly. And that the hotline is not only for anonymous reporting. So um, just wanted to clarify that you can give your name. Um, you don't have to, but you can give your name. 
Um, if someone gives their name, it does give us the opportunity, if we wanted to get more information, to be able to have a conversation with the person rather than going back and forth with a little question and answer thing that we would do through the case management system, and we would still be able to guarantee them anonymity um, even though we would be asking questions. In section three um, for the hotline review committee, I um, added some language about the investigative process, including that we could use an external investigator as needed. And um, we did do that in um, one of the cases that we investigated, hired, hired an external um, investigator. In section four, the case management section, I clarified how we actually report on the hotline. So the, the protocols currently say that we would do it as an information report, but we've been doing it all along as part of the auditor's office quarterly reports, and it allows a little bit of discussion about the cases. So I'm just formalizing that that would continue to be the way that we would report on the cases that have been called in. In section five, the case dissemination, um, what I did there was I updated the list of hotline review committee alternate members, um, primarily because there's been some changes in the city manager's office and the city attorney's office with the hiring of an assistant city manager and the principal senior attorney that it seemed like it made more sense to have a higher level official like that rather than a senior performance auditor, if the, particularly if the reason that we would be um, substituting would be that the, the call would be against the CAO. So I felt like that um, made more sense to, to up, um, update that. And then we also, as I mentioned earlier, where um, we had issues with not being able to really tell what was happening with cases if we, when we gave access to the case management system, limiting access to the case management system so that they would submit the report to us, which it, the, the um, protocols already called for but wasn't happening. So instead of giving direct access, we'd say, we want you to investigate this, give us the report, and then we can review the report and make a decision um, as the hotline review committee about the outcome of it. In um, section six, um, that's a new paragraph about coordinating with human resources. So we added that whole section so that <coughs> when um, there's, there's always been somewhat of a question about what's a personnel issue. And I think that we have an opportunity to really sit down and define what's fraud, waste, and abuse. We put some high level words in the, in the, um, in the protocols, but we really don't have definition around those or examples. And I think coordinating with human resources about what's appropriate for HR review versus what's appropriate for fraud, waste, and abuse can help us um, with actually managing um, what HR does and what we do through the hotline. And in section nine, we added a paragraph about corrective action. This is the one that you have that places memo for. The um, title says discipline, but we changed it to corrective action. And just indicating that there may be some sort of corrective action taken if a case is substantiated. And then we also added a new section 16 about advertising the hotline. And I think that is one of the key things for helping us get the right kind of calls um, and helping employees understand that the hotline is there, when it should be used, and what's appropriate to go through uh, another avenue. So um, some of the things that I think would be help, would really helpful, I think that we have right now a perfect opportunity to improve the hotline because human resources is currently beta testing an advice line for employees where employees can call in and get advice through human resources for certain issues. And I think it's the um, opportunity for us to say, this is the type of thing that goes through the hotline, this is the type of thing that goes through the advice line. And they can always call the advice line and if it's something that they would say is fraud, waste, and abuse, we can refer it back to, they can refer it back to um, the hotline, and if it's something that comes through the hotline, then we have the opportunity to say, you can, um, 
this isn't a hotline issue, but you can go to the HR advice line and get some, some questions answered. So I really think the timing is good right now to be able to start working on that. I also think having some advertising materials, um, again, that would say this is what the hotline's for, this is what the advice line is for, would really help employees understand the purpose of both and help us get um, hotline appropriate cases into the hotline and personnel management decision types of cases into the advice line. And then, um, as I said, we can just refer to people to the advice line as appropriate when needed. So just a couple of um, key conclusions um, through my research. One of the things that I've really seen is that education is the key to a successful hotline. And I don't think you can ever expect, I don't know that you really want to generate a lot of calls. You want to think of it as sort of insurance, an extra line of defense against fraud, waste, and abuse um, so that the, it's there if people see it and you want to encourage them to report when when they see something but you also don't want to encourage them you want to discourage them from using the hotline as a gripe line which is somewhat what it what it has become so that um, addresses all of the things I had what I'm asking for tonight is just um, some direction about whether or not you want us to do some advertising, and if so, um, some direction about what that would be, and then um, the motion to forward this to the full council for approval. And I can take any questions that you have. So, Liz, you have yeah, a question? You want to go for your microphone? Ms. Harriet. Um, this has existed now, you know, for not that long a time. Um, is there something in here about what it's costing us, or am I just not seeing it? I didn't put the cost in there. So we actually just, I negotiated the cost down because um, we pay a per employee fee, and it was running about $3,000 a year, and I don't know where that originally 3000 an employee? No, $3,000 total, oh. but, but it's based on a per, per employee number. And so um, we recently got the, the bill for the next year, and I saw the number on there and said, I don't know where this employee count came from, but it was way overstated by a few hundred. And so um, I worked with them and got the count the countdown. So it was about, I, I want to say it was about 1200 for this past year. But we, we lowered the price quite a bit by correcting the employee count. And that's typical, the typical way, typical way those hotline um, service agencies call uh, contract is it's a per employee charge. Well, I, I, this was a controversial program to start with. Um, I have a feeling it's one of those that once you start it, you can never stop it because who's going to say we wanted to stop the fraud, waste, and abuse hotline. Right. Um, but but I do remember there was a good deal of discussion about it at, at the beginning. So you had some background on some of the other cities. Do most of the cities in our county have this hotline? No. Um, I did not find a lot. So I believe San Jose has one, but it's not run through the auditor's office. I think it's run through um, their city administrator. Um, and I believe Santa Clara County may have one, but most of the cities in our little area don't have one. Mm -hmm. San Francisco has one, Oakland has one, Sacramento has one, um, Long Beach, Los Angeles, San Diego. Um, the big cities, yeah. 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 Do you think it's a value for a small city like us? Well, we you did can have, hedge your answer, right? Harriet. We do. Ha we did have one. So, back around the headlines today it, said you got rid of an employee because of the hotline. That's right. That was so, I was asked several months ago to do a presentation about to to a department about what our office does. I did that presentation and I mentioned the hotline. And it was very shortly after that 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 complaint came in and it came in from that particular department and that's the one where um, the employee ended up resigning. So I, th I think that it, to me that just says if you explain what it really is, you'll get the right kind of calls. So 
your answer is hedged a bit, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. So, but if, if I were to say, if I were to be explaining it to someone else, I would say, well, even though most small cities don't have this, we felt it was critical in our city to have this because... Well, I think, you, like I said, you think about it as an insurance policy. You know, some people aren't comfortable reporting through their management or they've reported through their management and they haven't seen something happen. So they want that extra, that mm -hmm. extra piece of assurance that I can go somewhere and report. The ethics policy does recommend going through the chain um, you know, report through your supervisor manager when, whenever you can. Um, but the hotline is there for people who feel that they need to be um, report anonymously or feel like they don't necessarily want to report anonymously but really feel it's fraud, waste, and abuse and it needs to go through the hotline. So, um, I. Through the chair, could I ask a, a question of the city manager? city manager. Um, so I'd, I'd be interested in your assessment of this. It's not a great deal of money, but it is at the same time, um, I, I think it's always been a spirited discussion as to whether or not it really adds value in the city. So uh, I would continue to uh, be more on the, uh, as much on the half empty side as the half full side except for the fact that I think that the review that Harriet has done, you know, has been practical and been well-intentioned about can, how, how can we focus the effectiveness of the hotline better. Um, a lot of the things that have happened were things I predicted, um, and I don't mean it in that way, but the fact that we could get a lot of calls that were not relevant to the hotline. I mean, and we got two substantiated calls out of ultimately 34, so that's about 6%. I agree with Harriet, however, they'll say the one the call that we got that uh, clearly indica indicated a conflict that we were able to then deal with immediately cl came in through the, and so I think, I think our focus on insurance is a good way to think about it. Um, that being said, and this, I want to come back to the positive aspects of the recommendations here. Um, there is more than a cost of the direct cost of administering the hotline. There is the cost of responding, of investigating, of investigating people who are wrongly accused by an anonymous complaint. That's a cost. You think about it yourself. We can even look through history of examples of societies where anonymous complaints have been able to um, put innocent people under a lot of stress. <coughs> and what I, what I think, though, what Harriet has tried to do here is really working with, with uh, Rumi and HR is to start, is really draw a clear line, clearer line both through education and the focus of, of her work with the committee and others to sort of you know, let's 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 reduce false alarms. Really, that's sort of like our fire department. We probably spend a lot of call, a lot of our money running on false alarms rather than real fires. And so, what you always want to do is try and get those down. And that's what I think she's tried to do here with both the focus, the education effort, and the ability to sort of steer things more to HR when they need to be there. Um, so, you know. If, if we were just staying on the same track, I'd be more concerned about where we're going. I think Harriet has exactly the right idea of saying there will be some situations, they should be small. I thought the Sacramento thing was interesting. It was sort of like we really reduced our, uh, in, uh, increased our calls a lot, but, but you know, they, they really didn't have real change in how many of them were substantive. So you kind of go, gosh, um, is more volume what we're really after? No. Mm -hmm. What, we're want, what we want is the quality, so to speak, not the quantity, the quality of mm -hmm. the calls to be things yeah. that we would not get otherwise. That's really what I think the insurance is. And I've come around to the fact that, it, that carefully managed as it is, I think, uh, well, I think in practice, Harriet has tried to very carefully manage it. I think this is designed to clarify more of our intent and how we kind of move forward. 
you know, I do think we'll, we'll be able to reduce false alarms. Hopefully, these guys working together, we steer even more people also through the advice line and other things. And um, so I, I think that mm -hmm. So So Jim speaks of an inherent cost. In addition to your $1,200, there are also unintended consequence expenses as well which aren't woven into this. But I, I think maybe the thing that would bother me the most is that is an anonymous caller can call and say, um, I don't like Rooney's outfit today, or I, you know, some, something very trivial, but, or I don't like the way they're talking to me. Um, and th that's the kind of thing I've worried about with this, is that it's so, it's so easy to call and, um, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I hope it continues along that same pathway. Mm -hmm. And if you advertise, are you talking about internal advertising or are you talking about something that we're going to spend money on? So it would be internal. I mean, we'd have to spend some sort of money probably for printing some documents. But I think updating the website, having information both on the you know, the city auditor website where we currently have Probably some information. <laughs> and, and, and on the HR website, you know, it can link to both to a common place. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think that would be um, helpful. Yeah. Just, I think yeah. just the, uh, updating the website is, is not a big expense compared to some yeah. things that other people do. Well, I I, as, as I said, there's no way we're going to drop this yeah. because once you get started, you, you don't stop. You know, it's like many of the other programs that we have started. It's virtually If I could uh, just follow up to, to what, to what uh, Harriet was saying. So I think really <coughs> the focus she wants to put on education, which isn't just like come one, come all. It's to try to distinguish what this is for. And our ability to generate feedback loops to the organization about this was not a fraud, waste, and abuse call. Don't misuse the line. And this was worthwhile. I think that that will, I think that's designed to really improve, improve the clarity and the effectiveness. And uh, the truth is, is that um, it may be actually that we get a few more critical calls as people start to understand what's, wow, this what, is what this is really for works. versus some other stuff. Because mm -hmm. I'm sure some other people can pick up back up the fraud so, waste. I, I appreciate having, that's more of a, I think, kind of overarching, almost philosophical discussion than what we're talking about tonight, which is a pretty straightforward kind of motion. But um, I appreciate getting that background on it because it certainly has gone like this for several years. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Tom? Yeah, um, thanks for the report. Appreciate the work. I appreciate the comparison with other jurisdictions. Um, I think, you know, explaining what it's for during employee orientation makes a ton of sense. Um, I'm curious to hear a little bit more about the advice line and how that will be pitched in terms of these HR issues that have been coming in on the abuse line. Is the advice line for HR issues, like management issues? Romy Portillo, Human Resources Director, Chief People Officer. Uh, yes, the intent of the HR advice line is to really provide a um, kind of a, a one-stop type of place for uh, employees to call in for interpretations of their union contract, um, to talk about maybe some of the practices that they're having out in the um, departments and to know whether maybe a request that a management employee has made of them is an appropriate request. It's also an advice line for managers to call in. Um, we actually, you know, we provide a lot of that consultation on a regular basis. We have, you know, we're a very busy office. We have people in all the time, management and employees. But this would be one way to really have people feel, um, where the attempt is to have people feel more comfortable um, you know, regardless of their level in the organization, to reach out and just, you know, it's the Kaiser nurse model. Is it, but it's not anonymous? Uh, it is not. It, it, it gives the option to be anonymous um, okay. or not anonymous. And so is there still um, a gray area where there's, like, gross misconduct by a manager with a lot of people reporting that? Is that an HR issue or is that a fraud uh, abuse? 
Yeah, well, issue. the thing, when it comes to the personnel issues, there, <clears throat> the thing to remember is there are other um, avenues for employees to report. So we have uh, a harassment policy. We have a hostile workplace um, uh, policy. Yeah. So there are obligations for managers so you, to report. So you guys feel like the line's clear? Um, it's hard. There may be some situations that might be, I'm trying to think what types of things. Um, well, what I would say is that uh, as Harriet and I looked over the, um, you know, the calls, what we found is they were duplicative. And um, so, and even in the case where the employee who resigned and there was a very, um, you know, egregious situation there, that had also been reported in by an employee into HR in an anonymous way. So even that call was duplicative. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's just I mean, that I and I'm and I'm I'm just I'm not saying um, definitively that there's a bright line because very often in personnel issues, they can be messy, yep. and there's very few bright lines in our work. Okay, <laughs> that, that's helpful. And again, I think duplicative can be good because it might indicate more of a problem if multiple people are reporting the same issue. Um, can, can I so, say she was saying something different though? I mean, it could be that. The same call or called into called both places. HR, but sure. so both of those factors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I do like the idea of insurance, and and three thousand dollars seems like we're wasting time talking about it. Um, I do think again, you guys focus on the right things, kind of efficient management of kind of a, a low volume kind of thing, and and I like the updates to the document. Um, annual training was mentioned in here, and I guess would that be part of? Um, other training that's already in place. I mean, I wouldn't want to see an additional mandatory training just for the hotline. Yeah. But well, in terms of the hotline rollout that had already been conducted, we did fold it into our ethics training. Okay. So we had ethics training, and so 850 of our employees did hear firsthand about the ethics hotline and the intent and to call. Um, but as far as on an ongoing basis, we have a great opportunity with Neo, and then we will have you know other trainings that we yeah, would do. I, mean, I think we would fold it in system. rather than yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so hard to pe pull people offline for training. Um, I had so. Two questions. So, so other cities expanded to residents, contractors. I mean, where where do people go if there's an issue? If a contractor sees an issue, what where can they go? They're, you're saying they can't use this line. It's not designed for, it's the line currently is designed only for internal use. So I would assume they could go to the city manager's office. I mean, lots of ways. Sometimes they go to city council members. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's a lot. So okay. as far as like. I'm thinking more about contractors as we outsource or use yeah. contractors more. Yeah. I don't know. Oh. If I might jump in on that, I guess maybe the question is. Have we considered expanding it to include and make it available to contractors? And is that something we would want to do? I think is that kind yeah. of the just the question. Well, that, yeah. And if not, where where do they go? Yeah. Well, so I mean, I think there's a couple. I mean, part of the issue is, in in any situation, what who's the right person to call? But then the the other side of it is. How does somebody know who the right person to call is, is what the issue is. So, for example, on many contractor stuff, particularly, I mean, like uh, 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 construction and other contractors, these folks have licenses, their licenses identified, the rules pretty much uh, there about how to report issues related to uh, a contractor. That still doesn't mean that the public would understand that avenue. Um, and we certainly don't have one sort of location that would saw it, say almost any sort of contractor issue here is how you call. I'm sure the city attorney gets them. I'm sure our p police department get calls. We do a whole bunch of them. Then they're, they're coming in. I think the larger question is, is there, is there anything that Harriet could ultimately learn from those folks in more detail about their own focus receipt of stuff? Is a, you know, how different that is from folks who don't have that approach? I, I just don't know what the ROI would be on that. Right, and and most of the um, jurisdictions that responded that they do accept calls from outside parties, they don't track where the call is coming from, so they don't generally track it by it's an employee call versus some someone else. Yeah, we did receive one. Um, it didn't come through the case management system. It came just via an email where a resident reported something, 
but it was because it was coming from a resident, I didn't accept it as a hotline call, and I turned it over to the city manager's office. That was more than a year ago. And also a question about filing malicious complaints. Um, it says we won't tolerate it, but if it's all anonymous, it's, I mean, it's just... Right. It's, it, you, it's hard to enforce that because right. we don't know who's calling. Okay. Um, the other question I had, uh, last question, I think, was... So I understand the change under number one um, that directly relates to the city of Palo Alto. When you explained it, that it made more sense. When I first read it, I was like, well, what if what if a city employee is engaged in fraud that relates to the state of California? Are we saying that that's not appropriate? Oh, they, they can, well, if it's fraud, if it's a city employee, they can still, someone can still call it into us, but there's also a state auditor, the state auditor yeah. also has okay. a, a hotline. Right. I, I guess the question was really, do we want reports of employees conducting fraud if it if it doesn't relate to the city of Palo Alto? <laughs> That's the way I read it at first. Was we don't we only care about yeah. Um, okay, uh, if if it's all right, I guess I, I, I know you guys probably want to speak, but I go ahead and make the motion uh, to approve approve the staff motion to accept these changes. Go for it. Yeah, it. yeah, I did. Done. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, do you want to speak to your motion? Uh, no. If, if Lydia wants to, to comment about anything. I'm going to have a couple of comments as well. Sure. But Liz, do you want to speak to your second? I think only to say that I think the discussion we had earlier tonight is one that we should keep in mind and also be really aware of anonymous issues because they can cloud the situation pretty quickly. Right. And I, th I think we've done a good job <coughs> recently as those are coming in um, and really saying this isn't a fraud, waste, and abuse, and we and we, and we've just started responding to them. It does. It's not. We we used to just <coughs> automatically respond. We'll look into it, and we're not doing that anymore. We're now we're looking at it and saying, is it fraud, waste, and abuse? And we're responding appropriately based on the content of the complaint. Um, so our initial contact back is <coughs> going to let them know either we're going to look at it or we're not. Okay. Good. Good straightforward way to to handle it. Good, thanks. Lydia? <clears throat> Thank you for kind of looking at all this and kind of evaluating the whole program and kind of getting it more focused and directed at what you want the outcome mm -hmm. to be. So I feel very confident, you know, that you will have um, this, you know, the desired results that we're looking for. And I look forward, you know, I, I guess at some point there's going to be another update on how this is progressing, and I look forward to that. So just a couple of questions. I, I th I'm not sure we want to propose a change at this time, but I think that this question of whether at least city contractors should be able to utilize our hotline, I mean, I kind of lean towards thinking that might be a good idea as an expansion of the program. I'm less enthused about having it open to the entire public. Um, I, I, guess <coughs> be, I might be persuadable on that. Um, doesn't sound like there's a lot of effort towards that. Um, I'm not sure if staff has any thoughts about whether that's something, at least expanding it to include contractors is something we might consider for the future. Uh, if we want to consider that, what do we need to include in the motion? Is that something you guys have, you know, where, where do you think we should go with that? To jump on that though, how many are we discussing? How many contractors? Well, so, I mean, that gets kind of complicated. So let's just take something like uh, our solid waste contractor. So that's, I mean, that's potentially everybody driving trucks around town or whatever, picking things up, right? To, so, I mean, I think we'd have to sort of look at that. And, you know, I mean, we do get calls, you know, more often than not, they're sort of complaint or service calls, whatever it was. I didn't like how they did this or whatever more than... You know, and it's probably more often sort of waste or abuse. Gosh, they 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 come so late, or why well, are they making so much? I noise? was thinking more if the contractor themselves. I was thinking that way as well. Yeah, right, observed right. something that they thought might rise to the level of fraud, waste, or abuse, either with the contract on their con con contractor side or on the city oh, side, okay. that the contractor employees could utilize the hotline. 
uh, that, if that would expand the number of people using the hotline. That would increase the cost of the hotline because it's on a per, you know, per employee basis. So I'm not proposing that we make that change tonight. My question is really, um, how can we have that conversation? Just, just to think about that in the future. Yeah. I, I think it's a progressive thing. I think we do some changes now. Maybe we come back in a year and we, we say, okay, we did these changes. Was it effective? And then we decide whether or not to expand it. Because if, if all of a sudden we started getting a lot of calls that were legitimate just from employees, then we'd have to look at it from a resource perspective and say, can we handle more calls? <laughs> right. So. Um, Okay, yeah. great. And, and I don't think that needs to be in the motion, but that's something that we can we can pick up in the future and think about. But I'm glad that we've broached that question. I think it's an important question. Uh, also on the question of contractors, um, because we've, you know, if you look at the first paragraph in this idea of expanding it to include not the potential targets, you could say, uh, to include not just employees, but potentially contractors. Just a wording thing, I hate to get in the weeds on this, but do we want to add the words or contractors in the start of, uh, in the first line of paragraph two? So it would say, city employees who have specific information that other city employees or, or contractors, contractors. Yes. have engaged. Mm -hmm. Do we, we want to add that. that in there? Uh, yes. I don't know if that needs to be in the motion or you guys, it'll be encompassed I, by the motion. I think it should be in the motion to change it. I'm, I'm not yeah. comfortable with that as the seconder. I, I think we're... I, I think we're getting into dicey area. Well, the, I, I, I'm not. It, I'm comfortable with it. You are. So let me just clarify that would merely align the second paragraph with the first paragraph. So it's not to allow contractors to call in and say, and if an employee involve, uh, observes fraud, waste, or abuse on the half on behalf of a contractor doing yeah. business with the right. city. And that was one of the changes you were trying to make. I, I just thought right. it was yes. an so oversight. About it the other way around. Yes. yes. Right. Thanks. Would you be okay with that? Yes, as I long as too. it isn't what I thought Great. it was initially. Great, okay. Uh, and then um, this answers those questions. And just a, a quick comment. Um, uh, yeah, actually, I do think that these two hotlines are important. <laughs> and the process of studying how they can be more effective, be more clear, uh, how we can educate employees to see where their concerns might be better addressed to the HR line, uh, potentially as a, a confidential call, as opposed to the fraud, waste, and abuse hotline. I think that's important. And I, I really appreciate uh, the teamwork that's happening here. Uh, yeah, anyway, just as a philosophical question about good governance, I think it's important that we do have those safety valves, right? When the insurance policy, whatever metaphor you want to use, so that when somebody does feel that they've observed something that makes them very, very uncomfortable, but they're worried about going through the official chain of command for any reason, that they feel comfortable uh, and confident that uh, th there is a place they can go, not just going to an elected official or going to the press, but some kind of uh, shunted <coughs> internal process uh, where their concern will be heard and where they will not face retaliation. I, I think it's a really important thing. I think it's important for the city. And I, you know, I have heard you know, from, uh, from employees, not frequently, but just that you know, maybe they had a, a gripe about something or they had a concern about something and asked, well, did you either go to HR or did you call the hotline? They said, I heard a concern that um, people didn't necessarily always feel comfortable using any of the avenues that they knew of uh, without fear of retaliation, that they were, not, they lacked the confidence that they could report in, in any mechanism and remain anonymous. That if they reported, it would be, they felt it would be obvious who they were and they'd face retaliation. And so in that context, I, I do think that this is an important program. These two hotlines, really, the HR one and the fraud, waste, and abuse hotline. And again, I appreciate the effort to um, to improve them, improve education about them, again, so that our employees do feel um, uh, that if they have a concern, you know, that it, that it will be heard and it will be tackled in a way that preserves their confidentiality if that's an issue. And sometimes just knowing that that option's there makes people feel more comfortable and improves workplace morale, even if they never use it, right? Um, just like having insurance for anything else gives you peace of mind. And I think that that's important in itself. Um, so, uh, uh, City Clerk, do you clear on the amendment they were making uh, to add that 
those two words or contractors in, in that second line. Yeah. Okay, any other comments? All right, so uh, all in favor of the motion? Aye. Aye. Look, I'll passes unanimously. Mr. And Chairman, would you, would you indulge me as city manager for like three or four minutes, just one last thing on this, that maybe I'm gonna tell you things that you already know, but um, as, as we've often sort of said, you know, a hotline is insurance, right? And so if you think of the insurance metaphor, it's like, okay, we, uh, we all wanna have health insurance um, in the event that our health fails or we have problems with our health. So there's another whole focus on being healthy in advance of insurance or anything. So we also have health lines in our city. I'm just playing off of that in the sense of what is it that we do that sends positive messages, creates a culture where people just naturally feel either valued or um, uh, regardless of their position equal, um, uh, able to kind of communicate and I, I would just share Neo with you just as one symbol of what we have particularly new council members so we have a very distinctive onboarding orientation process in our city um, every employee we bring on almost says it is the best welcoming and orientation process they've been in any job that they have it lasts two days. Every employee starts on the same day, their first day of work, regardless of their position. So we don't have people coming in one at a time. Every month, anybody new we hired, and everybody goes through an orientation that takes them on a full tour of the city. They get a briefing by the historian. They're over at Stanford. They meet people, people in every area. I mean, they see the Baylands, a water treatment plant. They see neighborhoods. They go up to Foothills Park. And, you know, we, we talk with a lot of them. They meet uh, supervisors. They come in and meet the whole leadership team every Tuesday morning. Everybody introduces himself from, you know, the new inspector we have to a department head. Um, and at the end, when we do the briefing, you know, we ask people what it was like. They said, gosh, I had no idea. I mean, I had heard Palo Alto is a neat city, but when would I have ever seen all of the diversity of the city? When would I know the history of, of the community? I've never felt so welcomed before. And I, and I like this sort of, I, I sort of play this back with them at times. I, they, they said, yeah, most of the time I've usually showed up and they showed me where my cubby was in my new job and said, you know, and I said, yeah. And then we basically did a briefing for you that it told you your benefits and told you how you could sue us if you had a problem or a complaint and that was it. No, really, and this is, this is the point. There is a complete, human beings respond to incentives and positive things and really feeling included and to be honest with you that's where we're putting 90 percent of our efforts in trying to do that and then having both insurance and the, the ability to be responsive to you know very either legitimate complaints or in the case of people needing training and learning that's what we're trying to do so thank you for that indulgence just just one quick comment i'm sorry so uh being at google uh, they do similar things and this idea of psychological safety in the workplace is really important. And I think you could pitch the fraud abuse waistline as part of that psychological safety. So I think it could have a very positive spin for employees at orientation. Yeah. Lydia, do you have another comment on this one before we move on? The council members didn't get that orientation. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> that's a great idea. No, actually, we should do that. You know, the the problem, the one problem with Neo is every employee who came on board before Neo complains about the fact that they have never had the orientation. <laughs> All right. Well, let's move on to uh, future meetings and agendas. And actually, I was going to hope I was hoping that uh, Harriet. Uh, and uh, Jim and maybe Terrence, you might want to, all of you could stick around just for that quick sure. discussion. Uh, Ruby, you're welcome to, but I probably le less need if you want to enjoy the rest of your evening, but hopefully this will be a very quick discussion. <laughs> uh, you'll all notice that um, uh, City Clerk's Office has uh, just distributed to us uh, an updated uh, tentative future items list. So I don't know if we want to take a look at that. Uh, there are a couple of key things I do want to point out right away. Um, one is, 
uh, some of the, the difficulties with scheduling in April as well as um, in August. Uh, we definitely want to, um, we would have difficulty meeting uh, on the originally considered date of April 11th. And so April 25th would probably work better as an April meeting date, uh, but just wanted to check how that works for everyone else. Uh, I'm checking right now. I think we had a, a conflict a with, meeting. oh, that's right, we had a council meeting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so there's a council meeting on the 11th. So would a couple weeks later on the 25th work for everybody else? April 25th? April 25th. That works for me. Good, you're uh, the main yeah. show. Yeah, but, so, but I'm going to have a change here. So number two <clears throat> would need to move to June. And number three in June can move up to April 25th. So sustainable purchase <coughs> audit moves up to April 25th and right. Hydromax cross bore moves right. to June. Right. And I won't be available for either of those dates in May, so that's why I kind of loaded up June. Okay. Sorry. And so, Liz, you said you're not available on April 25th. You're out that week. And how about you, Lydia? I have a human HRC. I'm there Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I'm your alternate, but maybe we can find another council member to attend. Um, uh, but it's it's not required that we attend HRC meetings as liaison. It's strongly encouraged. I I, I certainly tried to make all of them. Either, um, but that. Yeah. So. I, it, yeah. Are you guys okay with that then? Maybe mention it to the mayor and the 25th you're talking and about. Maybe, see, maybe we could get another council member to fill in for us at HRC. Who is it? Vice mayor, <coughs> I'm not well, here on the 25th. If not the 25th, what's another April date that would work? For me to for me to do that other audit, the sustainable purchasing on it, I would need to keep it that last week in April. Um, um, yeah, it was that whole week. But it wouldn't necessarily have to be Tuesday for me. It, I, I've gone all that week. So and, and so... You'll, you'll be fine with three. three. is okay, right? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. Yeah, as long as we're all here. Four and with three. Okay, so nobody catch, uh, catch the flu that week. Um, so let's stick with that. Uh, could I make one um, comment? Sure. Um, Don't forget I your mic. Buy on wireless. I I would hate to miss that. Don't forget your mic. Same thing. I, it, I, same same message. If there's any way we could do it later, data collection and privacy policy. That's coming up. Town hall schedule. Is town hall schedule a real long one? So the data collection is probably a longer one. Town hall schedule, hopefully not. That was something that, Tom, I think you had suggested that at the last meeting, and I enthusiastically supported having that conversation earlier. Is that a discussion about whether to have town halls, or is that a schedule? <coughs> I think we're going to you know, work with city staff to, to figure out when we can schedule those so they don't just okay, get well, if you want backloaded to know, at the end of the year. That would be my only request, is that I'd, I'd love to be here for the fiber and wireless, but if that's a time sensitive, it's fine. No, it's, it's, it's not crucial, Mr. Chair. I mean, from my point of view, we could swap town hall schedule. We could do that on the 25th as easily as on the 9th, as you would know, and we could move the fiber and wireless to the 9th if that's... I, I, I would uh, appreciate that. I've been involved in that for too many years. Would you guys be okay with that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was going <laughs> to... You know, is it going to happen in my lifetime? What do you think? We'll talk about it then. Depends on how long I live, right? <laughs> so then in May, there's actually, um, uh, there's a question about when to have the meeting in May because uh, May 9th is also a finance committee meeting. And so there's a question of whether we want to um, either have, either move that May 9th meeting or possibly add a second meeting in May because that June 13th meeting looks pretty packed. Um, I don't know if that's possible or advisable. My inclination is to say, let's stick with one meeting in May. Um, but does the 23rd or the 30th of May look any better for you guys than May 9th? 
I would be fine with the 30th, personally. Is that the Memorial Day weekend, people coming back from that? Is that oh, that yeah. Sunday? Would that be tough <clears throat> doing that the day after the 23rd or the 9th? I'm okay with the 23rd also. Well. What do you guys think? I, I guess I neglected to think about that. I, I, it would be awkward, difficult for me. I'm going to need to be in finance, but I really need to be here on both data collection and fiber, too. So the 23rd would be my preference if that works for you all. Uh, Lydia and Liz, how does the 23rd of May look for you? It's fine with me. I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I presume it's okay. Okay. And Tom? Yeah. Okay. So... So, so let's, what's going to be taken up on that date? Uh, so it would be the stuff that's currently listed as May 9th. We'll just change the May 9th meeting to the 23rd. Data collection and... And uh, actually the, and the fiber and wireless. Okay. Is our start time at 7 or 6? I think every year six. we've actually had... <laughs> I think, though, every year we've assessed it and we've decided on when to meet. But the official meeting time now for the... Council is six o'clock. And for this committee, I think for staff, it's easier if we do it at six. A lot easier for and staff. And I think that's why we started doing this at six. And let's us get back that's to our families. Head of the calendar at seven. Um, okay, and then in August, um, are you guys okay with going with uh, August twenty-second, tentatively? Uh, we come back on the 14th. Yeah, the 14th is our first meeting back. That's Monday the 14th. So it would be the following week. Twenty second works for me. Uh, Liz, Tom? I, yeah, I mean, we're... On the 22nd? There's a 15th of finance, I think. It will be two days after my 45th wedding anniversary, so I should be recovered. <laughs> All right. Corey, I, may I just comment that I really love having these scheduled throughout the year, but, you know, this is getting pretty far out to make an absolute commitment. I, I'm considering these tentative, but Good. we want to have something on the calendar right. at least penciled Good. in. Yeah, that's, right? that's helpful. Especially as we're planning our vacations and staff might be right. doing the same. Okay, and uh, any questions or thoughts uh, before we wrap up here so, um, on any of the items? I brought it before. I'd really like to have the Magical Bridge folks come in and just give us an update on what they're doing Good. and Yeah. Um, Good oh, don't idea. forget your mic. Sorry. The county just put in a lot of money to help them expand for Magical Bridge. Yep. So I'd love to see that get on the agenda. And again, I'm not expecting staff to do much work. I think we just invite them to come in. I guess the question was, do we want them to go to council or come to us? That's, I think that's why it was down here, right? I, I, I would agree with that because um, the county at the moment has, still has money. <laughs> How nice. Um, I think until Prop 30 stops, they, they will continue to have some uh, discretionary funding. And so they have put 10, as you, well, Tom, you might talk about it. They put 10 million into this. You brought it up. Do you want to give all the details? Okay, well, as, as, I, as I understand it, there will be $2 million per supervisor for their particular district. And there is an application process for it. And I think the Magical Bridge, though, here cost, does anyone remember, $3 million? Uh, was it the original three cost was three, and I yeah. think we got close to four. Yeah. It's not really agendized for this meeting, so I don't want to have too long a discussion about it, but just the question of do, is there an urgency to discussing it sooner? Uh, I, I'm happy to yeah. have it on our I didn't realize there was money available, so I think maybe it should <coughs> come yeah, to they, us. They, we could, they voted 10. Yeah. Can I just talk? Can, AI. So is there an urgency to have the meeting on Magical Bridge soon? That's the question for me. Just in case the money goes away. Right? It won't. It won't go away. So I'm going to talk until they stop me. It's not going to go away. They put the 10 million out there. It's two million a supervisor, mm -hmm. and everyone should know about it because we don't get money like that very often. Yeah. But I doubt we'll get any more because we already have the Magical Bridge. Okay. okay. That's being open. The other one, real Again, quick, I, never talked. Is I, I thought we needed to get to the airport operating plan, so I don't know. If okay. 
So these are just these clearly shout outs for getting these things scheduled, Mr. Chair. So yep. I mean as soon as we can, right? We'll Great. Them. Good. Yeah, I, I that yeah, I'm leaving the, I think we're leaving those as things we definitely want to get to this year and so we can continue figuring out where we can plug those in. And something tells me, you know, Probably some other things will come up in the course yeah. of the year that we yeah. haven't even thought of yet. Yeah, and actually the TCE and groundwater contamination, I'm guessing probably won't come to us as early as June 13th. So that one might get pushed to later mm -hmm. in the year. And so we might be able to, that might also help clear up the, um, so if sustainable purchases audit gets moved to April. Um, I can max back to June. April 25th. But, sustainable purchase. Right, and also if the TC gets pushed off, that means June 13th becomes more of a reasonable schedule. This is on the agenda. Are you are you thinking of incorporating any of those five suggestions that are at the bottom? Or are, you, are we just gonna let them kind of well, the, the, develop? I think, I think we need to you know, sit down, it really it's up to the city manager to determine um, and staff to figure out, and I'll work with them on when we can get those plugged in. But I think yeah, we've heard, Tom, we definitely wanna move Tom, forward I, them. Just Tom re emphasized two of them, yeah. um, you know, and as I said, I mean, you know, I don't think we're ready to talk about what we do next with jet noise. I think we've got to hit the next milestone of something in some ways if, as it relates to that. And, um, you know, I, I, there'll probably be some other items that come up that probably could even have more urgency in the near term, you know, right. by the time we get to August. And right. Yeah. And, I, and the marijuana thing is one we'd probably want to take up in the fall because we do have a a current ordinance that expires at the end of the year, and we might want to okay. be prepared for that. <coughs> All right. All right, very good. With that, the meeting is adjourned. Way to go. Thank you.